Hi, my name is Carl Lurch. I'm the principal engineer for the Tokyo stack at Amazon Web Services, and I'll be talking more about Rust in Tokyo with my colleague and fellow Tokyo maintainer, Sean MacArthur. So, Tokyo is an asynchronous runtime for the Rust programming language. It provides the building blocks needed for writing networking applications. And my goal for this talk is to convince you that Tokyo and Rust are great tools for building reliable network applications without compromising speed. And even though that Rust and Tokyo are relatively new, at Amazon we're finding ourselves using it often, especially when it comes to data plane services. The adoption's really driven because of that ability granted to us by Rust and Tokyo, that ability to build reliable network applications without compromising speed. For example, in an earlier reInvent talk, Mark Brooker spoke earlier about how they introduced Rust within Lambda. And I'm gonna tell you all about this, but first I wanna start by talking about how I first got into using Rust. A while ago, I had some free time and I was itching to start a new side project. Distributed databases were always an interest of mine, so I decided to try to write one. Now, of course, before writing any code, I had to pick a programming language. And initially I was leaning towards using Java or Go in part because I had experience there, but also because looking around at other databases released around this time, it seemed like this was the language direction to take. Now, this is interesting because at first glance, picking a language with a garbage collector for a database might be a little counterintuitive. Databases process data, a lot of it, which in turn creates garbage. So every so often, the garbage collector needs to pause execution and do its garbage collection. And this results in unreliable tail latencies, which then cascade back to the application. So why not use C or C++? This is what older projects such as Postgres and MySQL use, and they have done so successfully. And it's true, C and C++ do not come with garbage collectors. Instead, they put the responsibility of managing memory on the programmer. So the programmer is responsible for allocating memory and freeing memory. The programmer is also responsible for ensuring that pointers are still valid before dereferencing them. And none of us are perfect. Sometimes we write bugs. There will be times that we get that memory management wrong. And when we do get it wrong, the program can forcibly terminate with a segv. And I've debugged a few of these and they're no fun, especially when they happen in production. But the thing is, when faced with a memory management bug, a segv is the best possible outcome. Because if you don't get a segv, another outcome is going to be an exploit. You might have heard of um, Heartbleed and WannaCry. These are two high profile vulnerabilities that were caused by memory management errors. And these are not outliers. Large C and C++ based projects such as Chrome and Firefox, have, they've done some analysis on their bug histories and they have found that on average, 70% of all of their high severity bugs were caused by mismanaging memory. So, in short, historically, when picking programming languages, there's been this trade-off between safety and performance. Now, in this context, picking a language with a runtime for a database might make more sense. So safety really needs to be a top consideration, especially in a multi-tenant situation. So while it's possible to write correct and safe code with C and C++, it takes more knowledge and effort. One has to invest in additional work to ensure correctness. So things like audits, static analysis, fuzz testing, formal verification, or other strategies. So to get things done faster, it's nice to be able to use a language that has the safety aspect built in, even if this comes at an additional cost, like some runtime performance. So given all that, Back when I was going to pick a language for my hobby database, I was leaning towards Java. 
However, I was talking about it with a friend, and he said, "Hey, why don't you check out Rust? It's this interesting language that Mozilla is working on." So, I did check out Rust, and it really got me excited. Rust sells itself as a systems-level programming language, similar to C or C++. It does not have a runtime or a garbage collector, just like C and C++. However, unlike C and C++, it guarantees memory safety. So all those security vulnerabilities that I mentioned earlier, they can be prevented with Rust. And and remember, I said Rust comes again without a runtime or a garbage collector. Instead. Rust proves memory safety at compile time. So you write your program, you compile it, and if there are memory issues, compilation fails. If compilation succeeds, you can trust that there will not be memory management errors or any other sort of undefined behavior. And this is really powerful because that trade-off that I mentioned earlier, that trade-off between safety and performance, it goes away. Now you can have both safety and performance, and this is huge. It's it's a fundamental shift. So, Rust implements compile time memory safety verification using a concept called data ownership. In Rust, data can only have one owner, and the owner of that data is a variable or a struct field. So when that variable goes out of scope, the data becomes unreachable and it's freed. The key here. Is really one owner. With that requirement, the Rust compiler is able to statically track the lifetime of data as it flows through the program. So let's work on a quick example. Here is a short snippet. So we create a string and we assign it to foo. That string is owned by foo. When foo is passed into the take ownership function, foo no longer owns the string. So ownership is passed into the function. If we were to try to use foo again after that first call to take ownership, the program would fail to compile. So, look in the take ownership function. That variable s now owns the string, and note nowhere in the function do we explicitly free the string. When the function returns, s goes out of scope, and because s is the owner of the string, the Rust compiler knows that that string can no longer be referenced, and it automatically releases any associated resources. And in this case, the memory is freed. So, using Rust, the programmer has full control over memory management. So the program the programmer can allocate memory on the heap or the stack, but the programmer does not have to remember to free memory. This is done automatically and prevents that whole category of bugs. So, back to my attempt to write that distributed database, I'm still at the point of trying to pick the language, and I got the recommendation to use Rust. And after learning about that promise of writing code with reliable code without compromising on performance, I was sold. And I was going to write my database in Rust. So there was a problem. It was a while ago, before Rust was even at 1.0, and there was no ecosystem around it. And I wanted to work on networking services. So at that time, Rust only offered basic blocking TCP socket APIs. So I decided to yak shave. I would start by writing a networking stack. Now, six years after that, I still haven't gotten out of the yak shave and back to the distributed database. But we do have a mature networking stack for Rust. You know, we released Tokyo 1.0. It's reliable and stable. So, here is a basic Hello World example written with Tokyo. Even if you don't have any experience with Rust, it should be readable. We listen for inbound TCP connections. The loop processes these incoming connections, and for each connection, a new task is spawned, and we write Hello World back to the socket. And here, when I I say task, it's kind of like an asynchronous green thread. It's similar in purpose to concepts like Go routines or Erlang processes, if you're familiar with those. So tasks allow running concurrent logic. They also have very little overhead. So an application can spawn tens or hundreds of thousands of tasks. And there's something else I want to call out here. So notice that socket variable return by accept. That represents an open TCP connection. It's moved into the task. We 
try, if we try to use it after it's moved into the task, the code would fail to compile. Also, we never explicitly close the socket. The socket goes out of scope at the end of the spawn task after write all completes, and the owner goes out of scope. So Rust automatically releases that resource. For the socket type, that means closing the socket. So the implication here is we can't accidentally forget to close sockets, again, preventing a whole category of bugs. So out of the box, Tokyo provides everything needed for writing reliable networking applications. And it has everything you might expect from this library, so I'm not going to dig into detail. Um, all of this is covered in the documentation on the website. The URL will be provided at the end. Instead, I'm going to dig into what makes Tokyo and asynchronous Rust unique. So at the foundation of asynchronous Rust are the async and await keywords. And these aren't new concepts in of themselves, but the way that Rust implements them is unique. So here's a bit of async code. It reads in a way that looks synchronous. Each line completes execution before continuing on to the next. Yet, it, it never blocks the operating system thread. So every operation that may need to wait for an external event is annotated as an async function. In this case, the call to sleep needs to wait for 10 milliseconds to elapse. The code cannot block the thread while it waits, so the compiler will find all of these calls to await and transform them so that they yield execution back to the thread. The thread can then do other work. So let's take a moment to briefly look at how that code is transformed. Yeah, we're going to do a bit of a deep dive here, and I don't necessarily expect you to internalize all of this, but I made the claim that all of this runs without compromising performance. So we're going to pop the hood a bit to show you that this is true. The compiler transforms asynchronous tasks into a state machine. And this is a fancy way of saying that we're using a number to track which await point we're currently at. So when executing the task, we first look at the current state and we execute the code for that state. Here, this is illustrated using Rust's match statement, but you can also think of it as a big if else if statement. If the state is init, run this. Else if the state is await sleep, run that. So when the task starts running, it's in the init state, the sleep has started. Then when the sleep becomes awaiting on sleep, because the sleep cannot complete pending his return. At some point in the future, Tokyo is notified that the sleep elapsed and calls the task again. And so this time it resumes from the await sleep state and it can complete. So the main takeaway here is that we're using state machines and state machines are very like constructs. When writing non-blocking code directly by hand using ePoll, a state machine like this is a common approach. So Rust's abstraction models what would be done without the abstraction. So it does not, it does not add overhead. So back to the original example, we have the main task and that one task per socket. Both of these are compiled to state machines and are submitted to the Tokyo runtime for execution. But what does that mean? So we start with a bunch of async tasks, and these are submitted to the Tokyo runtime. They sit idle, waiting for events to occur. In our earlier example, that event would be 10 milliseconds elapsing. The Tokyo runtime also has another, a number of event sources. ePoll provides IO events on, the Linux, on Linux driving Tokyo socket types. And on BSD systems, this would be handled by KQ. On Windows, it's going to be handled by IOCP. And Tokyo also has a timer providing time-based events. There's a worker thread used to execute tasks when the event comes in. So the worker has a run queue of ready tasks it processes. When the 10 milliseconds elapse, the timer fires off an event. And Tokyo finds the associated task and pushes it on the worker's run queue. So the worker pops the task, it's gonna call poll function, and this is the function that executes when the state machine, you know, so it executes the state machine. 
The task either completes or it yields back to the worker. The task then becomes idle again, waiting for another event. So the Tokyo runtime also supports more than one worker thread. And it comes with a work stealing scheduler that can efficiently balance tasks across multiple threads. So applications can take advantage of many cores without having to do anything special. Now, you may be hearing more than one thread. Hopefully you're thinking, hey, what about thread safety? Well, let's talk about thread safety. So it turns out that Rust's ownership model has another benefit besides just managing memory. It's also able to entirely prevent data races. A data race happens when a thread is reading data and another thread unexpected, unexpectedly concurrently mutates that same data. So out of the box, another major category of bugs can be prevented with Rust programs, leading to more reliable applications. And this goes beyond what something like the JVM is able to provide. So while Java programs cannot seg fault, they can have data races. So with Java, the user is required to read documentation to ensure that they respect concurrent access patterns. With Rust, inc incorrect concurrent access means the program does not compile. So let's change our little example. Instead of writing a message back to find a compile time, let's update the example to take a message specified when starting the server. Here, message is a string, and it is passed in as an argument to the executable. But something is wrong. We have a bug. There is only one string, one piece of data, and there are many inbound connections that could be processed on many threads. They're all referencing the same string. The main task could complete first, while the other tasks are still running and attempt to free that memory while it's concurrently being accessed. So Rust says this does not compile. We get a helpful error message telling, it, telling us it can't move the message into the spawn task because it's happening in a loop. After the first iteration, message no longer owns the string. So how do we fix it? Well, one option is to move a copy of the data into each task. So after accepting the socket, the data's clone and the new copy of message is moved into the task. Now, Rust is happy. This is safe. The downside with this approach is that it comes with a bunch of copying. So if the message is big, the overhead from copying that can be significant. And there are other ways to solve this without copying, and I'm gonna leave this to Sean. So we have shown how Rust guarantees safety without compromising performance and how Tokyo uses Rust's ownership model to provide misuse resistant, misuse resistant APIs. And now Sean is going to show how to put this all together into practice. Off to you, Sean. Thanks, Carl. Hey there, I'm, I'm Sean MacArthur, an engineer at Amazon working on Rusty open source things. And in order to help developers understand these concepts that Carl's been talking about, how to build a network application in Rust. We worked on this, this example for quite a while. And I'm gonna show you how some of Mini Redis works, which highlights one of my favorite parts of Rust, a part that I think is super cool, but we'll, we'll get into that in a second. First, we're gonna talk about what Redis is because we, we rewrote Redis. But Redis, it's an in-memory database as opposed to a persistent database, the, the thing that Carl wants to write. So this one's already written. It's single process, usually with many, many machines all trying to talk to it. So it needs to support many concurrent connections. Of course, it needs to be really fast. And it's written in C. For our example, we thought, well, let's rewrite Redis. We called it mini Redis. And we rewrote it in Rust using Tokyo. It's mini Redis because it, it, it only implements a subset of Redis. So we'll only be looking at get and set. You see subscribe and publish, those are in the full example if you want to go and take a look at those. And it's also worth repeating, this is for educational purposes. We didn't write an actual replacement for Redis. This is just for learning. So the first thing that we have to do to make the entry point to the application is it's very similar to the hello world and all the other examples that Carl was showing earlier. You know, we accept connections, spawn tasks, it looks very similar. I just highlighted the differences here, the interesting parts that we want to focus on for our example. 
And that is that there's a database, the in-memory database part, and then there's, with each connection, we apply commands to the database. So first, let's, let's peel open that database type, the DB type you see there. To start, we figure it's going to be in memory, so it's just a hash map, which is super simple. It's got string keys, and then for values, just a buffer of bytes. But if you remember what Carl was mentioning about ownership, well, we want to share this across threads, across tasks, which could go across multiple threads. And Rust ownership doesn't allow you to. You'd have to make a complete copy. So we don't want to do that. We, we want to use the same database across all of the tasks. So we got to add something here. What we do is we wrap the hash map inside an arc. This is a reference counted smart pointer. And it handles all the bookkeeping for you. Uh, as you make a clone, increases the number. As the clone goes away, decreases the number. When there's no more outstanding counts, the whole thing gets uh, cleaned up. So this allows you to make really cheap clones into all the tasks. However, now that we've added an arc, the type system doesn't allow us to mutate the hash map because you have multiple references. You wouldn't want to have all of them trying to mutate at the same time. You'd have data races or undefined behavior. So we have to add something else in between there. We add in a mutex so that we can access the hash map concurrently. All the different tasks, all trying to mutate at the same time, we need a mutex to control this. And this is the, the, the favorite part of Rust that I was wanting to talk about. It's, it's super cool. So we're going to take a second here and explain how a mutex even works in the first place. The standard mutex, the one that exists in the standard library, it encodes the state of locking the mutex into the type system itself. So as we've been talking about with Rust and its type system, using the type system to ensure safety. And how this works is the lock, it protects the data inside of it. It doesn't protect a, a section of code, but actually instead, you can't touch the data inside of it until you take a lock. The lock returns a new type, which is another kind of smart pointer. And that, once you have it, you've only been able to get it because you've locked the actual mutex. You can then mutate it and know that no one else is touching it at the same time. And then when that new type goes away, its destructor cleans up, it, it, you're no longer borrowing the value, and the mutex itself is unlocked. You don't have to worry about, oh, did I, did I remember to unlock it or not? You can't mess it up. The compiler catches it for you. That's what's so awesome. You no longer, no longer have to go and check, did I remember to lock it before I mutated this data? Did I remember to unlock it? No. Type system. Make sure it's done for you. So back to the DB. This is the full type again. So it's a reference counted hash map protected by a mutex. Right? Now let's take a look at the second part I mentioned, which was to apply Redis commands to the DB. So the first thing we want to look at is, is you, the get command. We parse the get command and it says, hey, get me the value for this key. No problem. We've got the key right there. You'll notice the first thing we do is lock the DB, and it returns the locked guard that we were mentioning before. Again, this acquired an exclusive lock. So once we've locked it, no one else can peek in and see the value. No one else can mutate it or anything. Now we can just look in the hash map for the key. If it's found, well, we return a bulk frame to the client. If it's not found, we return a null. That's just how Redis works. Either way, when this function ends, the lock type goes out of scope, its destructor runs, the mutex is unlocked automatically. Again, we didn't have to think about it. It's just done. How do we do the other side? Well, once we've parsed a set command, which includes the, the key, but then also a bucket of bytes to store somewhere in the, in the database, it's actually pretty straightforward. Again, just like get, we locked the database, we now have exclusive access, so no one else has any is able to peek inside, no one else is mutating it. We've got exclusive access, and we just insert into the database. Now, if the value doesn't exist, well, hey, well, then we just put it into the hash map, and it's there. Nothing, nothing special about that. If the value did exist, the hash map replaces the value, and then takes the old bucket device that was there, and drops it. The bytes destructor says, 
Oh, I'm done. Cleans the memory immediately. It's not kept around for an eventual G sweep. The cost is done right then and there. So that makes it really consistent. And this really, really helps to keep the tail latencies down. You don't have an all of a sudden, oh, stop everything. Let's go clean up all the bytes that we no longer need. No, nope. each request pays the tiny little cost that exists and makes it all consistent. After the insert, we just return OK. And just like in the get example, the lock is released automatically once this function ends. We didn't have to think about it. And, and that's really it. We now have a working mini Redis. I mean, sure, I, I skipped encoding and decoding frames, but I mean, that's pretty straightforward, slightly boring. It's not worth a slide. And beyond that, we have a working server. And with it being so easy, how do you think our performance looks? We took a look. We ran Redis Benchmark, the, the tool that comes along with Redis, on a real Redis server and on mini Redis. And yeah, they, they perform the same. You don't have to look at it super closely. They're pretty much exactly the same there. Now, of course, there are some caveats. Uh, the benchmarking tool with the default options don't stress it out to the max. Um, you might, if you do that, eventually run into, hey, the new text might not scale as well. Don't worry. The actual tutorial that I'm going to link to later uh, has a section about how things you could do to try and make that scale if it were to be a problem. But, I mean, th think about this here. We made a concurrent server program. It's multi-threaded using Tokyo's uh, thread steal, uh, multi-threaded work stealing runtime. There's, we didn't use any unsafe code. There's no data races. There's no data corruption. Also, it's async or non-blocking. So that means it's able to support thousands of connections automatically. And we weren't even focused on making the fastest implementation. We were just trying to make a demo. And with all of that, it's still plenty fast. That's Rust for you. So Rust, it's the modern programming language where you don't have to pick between performance and safety. You get both. And that's because this borrow checker and the powerful type system keep you safe at compile time, costing you nothing extra at runtime. Tokyo is the asynchronous runtime. It's in Rust. It's what you reach for when you need to make reliable, scalable network applications. So what can you do next? Go check out tokyo.rs. I have here on the slide the, the link to the actual website. There's a tutorial to get you started. There's the full mini Redis example. It has tons of comments and actually a bunch of extra stuff that I didn't have time to show you in the slides. And there's more resources for learning, depending on the style that you like to learn in. You do all that, and that'll get you started building reliable network applications without compromising speed. I thank you very much.